Welcome to this week's episode of Coffee with the Journalist brought to you by One Pitch. The guests on our show include some of the most notable journalists from the top U.S.-based publications who cover topics including technology, lifestyle and culture, health, science, consumer products, business news, and beauty and wellness. We discuss their role, the types of stories they cover, what their inbox looks like, and how they connect with sources. Head to onepitch.co and look for the video page to learn more about our new video series featuring journalists from the show. Today's guest on Coffee with the Journalist is Mark Matusek, a reporter at The Information. Mark covers HR and corporate culture in the tech industry. During the episode, Mark shares his thoughts on a real pitch he received, how you can make your pitch relevant to the information's coverage, his thoughts and timelines for embargoes, and more. Let's hear from Mark now. Welcome, everyone. This is Beck Bamberger, and you are here at Coffee with the Journalists, where we drink coffee, we chat with journalists, we learn how to better work with journalists and understand how they do their job so we can be helpful as publicists across the nation, the world, wherever you're listening to. So here we are. And with us today, super exciting. I already messed it up once, Mark, but we're going to get it this time. Mark Matusek, He's a reporter at The Information covering HR, corporate culture, all that good stuff, which has to be absolutely fascinating, especially now. Mark, thank you for being here. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yes. Man, Mark, what a time to be reporting on HR and corporate culture. I was going to start with your inbox, and then I was thinking, no, let's start with the information. But actually, first, what is your overarching thoughts on the state of HR? That's a good question. One of the things that I found very exciting about this role is, to your point, the future of work and, and the way mm-hmm. we're changing has become a really hot topic right now in the tech world, in the business world more broadly. And I mean, the best way maybe to sum it up is it seems like right now, since the beginning of the pandemic, mm-hmm. the way we're working seems like it's changing more than it has in, I don't Ever. know, 100 years. Yeah, I mean, this is yeah. one of those rare periods where a large number of things, of substance of things are changing all at once. So Mm -hmm. yeah, there's a lot going on right now. Mm -hmm. You are not bored, I am sure. Okay. So Mark, for those who are not as familiar, can you give us an overview on the information and what you're all covering? Yeah. So the information is a subscription-based tech publication Mm -hmm. that covers everything in Silicon Valley and has a very tech-interested audience. So I think we go Mm -hmm. into the weeds on some sort of tech-oriented topics that may be the average general interest publication might not get into as much. Exactly. This is good. I'm a subscriber. I love it. It's meaty content. Okay. Now your inbox, Mark, which is where we normally start. How crazy is it in there? It's pretty manageable. Hmm. Hmm. (laughs) I love this answer, Mark. I think this is like the first time. Go ahead. Yeah. So I aspire to be an inbox zero person. It's happened about three or four times in the last five years. Okay. So in the morning, I will usually go through and Mark has read and archive everything I don't need or everything I can read and respond to quickly. And the reason I am rarely able to get the inbox zero is I like to save things that I want to either keep tabs on or flop on mm-hmm. at some point in the near future. Usually that means it's a source, for example, that I've been trying to schedule a call with and we're going back and forth and or maybe they've stopped responding. I'll usually have one or there's a story I'm working on and, and someone I want to keep close by that I want to remember to keep in touch with. I like keeping it in my inbox so I don't forget. So and then throughout mm-hmm. the day, emails are always coming in. So while I never almost never get to inbox zero, it's usually relatively manageable. I also don't get a crazy number of pitches too. So really that helps as well. Oh my, I find that fascinating because that is the opposite of what usually has happened on here. So what's not crazy? I would say in a given day, I probably get like somewhere in the range of 50 to uh, 100 or so emails, which is okay, that's, yeah, in, okay. A, that's, in an absolute a sense, a decent number of emails, but compared to other business reporters, particularly those yeah. who work for public. So I, I used to work at Insider before I yes. information and... I still never quite got to like the all-time crazy levels I've heard of. You know, some people who work for other publishers do, but this is a little bit less than that. 
And, you know, I've heard people being hundreds or even literally oh, thousands. And hundreds. I think I've heard of someone who yes. gets around like a thousand in a day. So yeah, this is manageable compared oh. to that. Oh, I don't think I've ever had a thousand plus in a day person on here. Not that they've admitted at least, <laughs> but there's definitely the spectrum of the let it ride people who have 279,000 unopened emails, and then the absolute down to zero ruthlessly every single day by 3 p.m. It's really interesting. There's no consistency in this journalism field. So it's really quite the preference that people have. Okay. So Mark, in those 50 plus maybe 100 emails that you do get, what is one of the best subject lines that you've recently received where you're like, hell yeah, I'm opening that email and I know it's a pitch? Yes. The best one I've seen recently is yes. why late stage layoffs mean hiring opportunities for early stage startups. Oh, that was the whole line. Yeah, that was the whole thing. It's right to the point. Boom. Yes. Now, I had recently, not too long ago, wrote mm -hmm. a story that generally along those lines. So it was not relevant to what I'm working on now. Mm -hmm. What I really like is it's short, it's concise, gets straight to the point. If I happen to have been working on a story about that, right now. Mm -hmm. That's definitely something that I would have immediately identified as something that might be helpful to me. Got it. So for that situation, which is a common pitch, hey, reporter, yes, yeah, saw you did a story and I have something that's really similar to that. Mm -hmm. And you're like, yeah, cool. I already did that. Did you save it? Did you like put it in your little like, let's just let me come back to it? Because you said like, okay, cool. Yeah, that was a good pitch. But what are you going to do about it? Come back to it maybe at some point? <laughs> Probably not. I, I think in this case, it had been so. I, I appreciate the technique. I'll say that. Yes. Okay. I think it's, okay. It had been, you know, I would probably write about one story every week or two. And, uh, and given how okay. recently I'd written about that, it seems yeah. unlikely that I'll be writing that story for a very long time again. Yeah, and yeah, so at that yeah. point, this will yeah. probably be, you know, yeah. irrelevant. Yeah. But I, I like the technique. I, okay. We like the technique. So timing is everything, as usual, with a lot of these things. Okay. Mark, do you have, if you had to have, three elements of a great pitch? So you got past the subject line. What's a great pitch for you? Concision is definitely key. Purposefulness, so getting to the point immediately. I think that the pitches I like most are the ones that don't do any of the like, hey, how's it going? Did you have a good fourth? I hope it was great. How are you doing? Yeah, maybe someday. Yeah. It doesn't bother me that much. I understand the spirit behind it, but uh -huh. the dream pitch email for me is something that's, you know, first sentence immediately explains to me what is happening and why I should be interested in it. It is few words as possible. Concision, purposefulness, and then the third would be relevance, which okay. honestly is hard because I think of the information, we're obviously you know, trying to write about the major themes in the tech world, but we mm -hmm. also try to go a little bit more off the beaten path and try to kind of find the stories that other people aren't telling. So mm -hmm. the relevance point I realized that I think is probably rather difficult when pitching the information relative to other publications, because it's very difficult for someone to guess what I'm working at any given moment. Mm -hmm. Very true. Okay. These are the elements. So, and by the way, is that like three sentence max? Do you want this in? I know some people have like, I better see that in like three sentences and I don't read anymore. Or are you particular about your sentence count? I don't know if I have a particular sentence. Okay. I'll be frank. I, <laughs> I might be the wrong person for this podcast. I very rarely open pitch emails because oh, I think it's part of it is because, as I mentioned, I usually won't open them unless I'm working on something directly related mm. to them. And given that I'm probably not working on the thing that they're sending all the emails about, I generally have enough to do in the day that I, I it would probably be better of me to be more responsive. But usually in the morning, I'm like, all right, I've got like seven things I want to read, you know, 40 things I want to respond to, but just sort of clear it all out. So yeah, you're kind of slammed. You're busy. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. This is good. So for any of your recent stories, Mark, now a lot of them have been layoffs and they're like big, big company layoffs like Tesla. Okay. A couple in Tesla. I'm sure you're busy with them. Okay. Bird, you know, scooters, all this PayPal, laying off, laying off, laying off. Like that's the thing of the day, Coinbase. Assuming not those, okay, those are like hard news. Oh, wow, they laid off 20% of their staff. Do you have any stories, though, of late where you're like, oh, that did actually come from a pitch. Thank you so much. No. No. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. It's nothing from a pitch. I yeah. actually did find someone through Quoted, oh, yeah, the website, portal, which is yeah. uh -huh. occasionally useful. So I've been trying to interview yeah. as many 
chief people officers at sort of relevant mm, tech okay. companies I can. I had noticed that Databricks chief people officer yeah. was, I think I just did a search chief people officer. I noticed that she was on quoted, which suggested that she might be interested mm. in interview. So that, while not quite from a pitch, I did do my initial reach out because I saw it in a sort of a PR oriented mm-hmm. context. Mm, I see. Okay. Mark, this is where you can be deadpan honest. So this is the point and this is the place. So I love this. Okay. Then exclusives or embargoes. Do you care? Do you ever use them? Not really. I mean, I don't yeah. really mind if something is embargoed. It's very rare that information that is embargoed from a PR person is something I'd want to get up in the next 24 mm. hours. Yeah. yeah that I would imagine usually If I'm using something from an embargo, I probably have at least a couple of days or a week before I would need to publish whatever I'm publishing. So Mm -hmm. I don't particularly care too much other way when it comes to embargoes. Today's interview will continue after this brief message brought to you by OnePitch. Are you curious to see the unique ways OnePitch helps PR professionals and marketers pitch journalists? Head to onepitch.co to learn about our new one pitch score and see how easy it is to find the right journalist to pitch your news to sign up for your free account today. Now back to today's episode. Given what you've recently covered, I'm sure no one's saying, Hey Mark, I got an exclusive on how we laid off 27% of our staff. So are exclusives just not even like on your radar? Not really. I mean, yeah. if someone were, I guess the kind of publishing bar for the information is really high. So if someone mm-hmm. were to offer an exclusive that was compelling to me and my editors and met that bar, great. But I think that's got also it, it. You know, okay. probably kind of hard to do. Yeah. And that is something with the information. It's not a breaking news place. It's not for that necessarily. So more deeper reporting type of pieces, investigative is more the jam. Yes, exactly. Cool. Okay. We talked about subject lines, Mark. We talked about the exclusive stuff. What about just building a relationship with you? Let's say I am a chief people officer. You are a great reporter in my tech industry. How would you approach making a relationship with you, especially this day and age? I generally am the one driving reach outs. This is probably something I can get better about, but there's just so many people I actively want to talk to that I devote basically all of my sort of source building time, whether uh-huh. it's on the record experts or people who are talking through their back channels, I kind of devote all of my time on that to talking to people I've reached out to mm. and recommended to be my sources. Mm-hmm. But one source or expert that's very valuable is, you know, I, I do like having sort of on the record experts that, you know, know what they're talking about and that I can turn to when I need a certain mm. kind of voice in a story. Okay. So I guess I would okay. say being available and also this is something I don't run into a lot, but also honest when when you're not, don't feel like you're kind of qualified or the right person to comment on a particular story. Mm. People are almost always good about this, but there have been a couple of times in the past where I've reached out to someone who, who looks like based on what they were doing or what their business did, that they might be a good person to comment on something I'm writing about. And then it's immediately clear once I get in the phone that uh, they have no idea what they're talking about. Yeah. And, just to and, and I totally Ooh. get that. Like, I don't begrudge on that at all, but just from my perspective, it makes me a little less likely to reach out in the future because I'm thinking, I don't know if I'm reaching out about something. I don't know if they're going to be frank about whether they're the right person to talk about. Oh, now this is a good insight because if you have that person who's like, I'm just trying to get my damn quote in. So I'll say whatever the hell I want to try to finagle some fluff piece into a piece that actually basically gets you a demerit on your list. Yeah, yeah, a little bit. It thankfully yeah. happens very rarely. But I mean, it, oh, you know, it, and if s- someone doesn't think they're the right person, I'm, I'm always fine with it. Hey, I don't think I'm the right person for this, but here are things I would like to talk about or keep me in mind and you know, obviously keep them in mind. Mm-hmm. Got it. Okay, so now that's a little bit of a pivot. And we talked with a handful of reporters here on just becoming that resource on the short list, basically. How does one then, you alluded to it a little bit, Mark, of like, oh, well, you're doing a bunch of the reach out. So is it in becoming a trustful resource for you? Is it consistency of response? Is it you give me good quotes? You say, hey, nope, I'm not the person to speak to that, but I can send you to so-and-so. I don't know. How do people get on your short list of being a resource for you? I would say quality of insight is number one. I don't particularly care about quotes per se. They're, they're nice mm. to have, but yeah. I would much rather paraphrase something that is, I think, very thoughtful and, and precise and, and sheds light yeah. on something. 
even if I'm using any quotes at all. So definitely quality and depth of insight is key. Depth of insight. Okay. If you say something, being able to explain why you Back think it that up. Yep. is very helpful. So that's by far number one. Okay. And then I'd say number two is availability or yeah, I guess. Speed, perhaps? Speed. Actually, not quite as much here because uh-huh. I usually will have at least a couple of days or a week to do reporting. I mean, it definitely, it's better to be available quickly than not. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. I usually, if I'm reaching out to someone, I will usually have at least three business days after that in which to complete interviews. So mm. I would say just generally being available and responsive. Cool. Yeah. Okay. This is good. Okay, Mark, I have a little fill in the blank part. Let's see what your answers are. Are you ready? Yes. My favorite sources always. Give me tips that could lead to scoops or interesting features. Okay. You'll never get a response from me if. Your email isn't relevant to my beats. Yeah. Have you gotten, by the way, what's like the most off email you have gotten of a pitch? Like, hey, I'm from supply chain management company (laughs) so-and-so. I don't know. I got a number of those. They sort of don't really register in my brain. But let's see. Let me go through what I have right now. Here's one that isn't super and it makes sense because I used to tra- cover transportation tactical fleet sponsors mammoth invitational oh um, god <laughs> that's <laughs> horrible yeah oh oh god yeah okay perfect illustration thank you for pulling up a live example we love that okay the appropriate amount of lead time for a story is i would say a week or so i usually have okay. around at least a week to not always, but if it's a story that's not coming together very quickly, like a scoop or something like that, usually have at least a week. Okay. Okay. At least a week. And my favorite stories to write are? Inside looks at companies and the people behind them. Okay. Very good. Okay. Now, Mark, what are you reading, watching, consuming, listening to? Basically, anywhere else you get stories from, what you got? In terms of what I read, like, I guess, work-related, I read all of the standard big Business publications, the journal, Bloomberg, the New York Times, Insider. That's the standard roster of business publications. Outside of that, in my free time, I'll definitely read some some of that as well. I'll read also a lot of the kind of standard big name magazines, New Yorker, The Atlantic, New York Magazine. I've been reading books wise, I've been reading yeah. largely nonfiction for the last like a year or so, for whatever reason. I used to split fiction and nonfiction more evenly. Me too. That's what I usually do, 50-50. But yeah. nonfiction, huh? Okay. Well, I'm getting back into it. So for whatever reason, I just didn't have much of an interest in fiction for reasons that are mm. I don't understand. It's like, you know, can't really explain. <laughs> but I've just started getting back into fiction recently, which has been exciting. I found my, for whatever reason, my desire to read it is, is back. So that's good. I've started reading this book of short stories by Alice Munro. Called hate ship, friendship, courtship, love ship, marriage. Hate ship. Oh wow, wow. Okay, I gotta look. Oh, I see it right here. Okay, love ship, marriage. Wow. Do you like it? Oh, it's not available on Audible. Damn. Okay. Oh, devastating. Yeah, I really like it so far. So I read this because I had come across a famous short story of hers that was in the New Yorker a while ago. Mm-hmm. I had searched. Right, it was published before I read the New Yorker, but it's called Bear Comes Up in the Mountain, and it was like. Maybe the best, like most devastating short story I've ever read. So I, was oh. like, I, need to, I need to read more of this. Oh my. Wow. Wow. A devastating story. And you were like, yes, more, please. Yes. Devastating <laughs> in a good way. Very emotionally involving and extremely yeah. well um, Oh, Oh, and that's hard in a short story to like yeah. get so into it. Damn. Oh, now you're okay. This is why I love this question because everything I've now consumed and watched and listened to has been from this show, by the way. That's my hack. Okay, good. Anything else? Are you watching anything? What do you got? Yeah, so one more recommendation on the watching. So I I just recently started the third season of Atlanta. That had been sitting around for a while. And I just watched the first episode last night and it was spectacular. So that's another recommendation. What's it on? FX. But it's streaming on Hulu. Oh, it's on Hulu. Okay. Okay, great. Atlanta. Okay, cool. All right. Oh, and it's a comedy drama. Oh, that's good. Oh, and it's three seasons. You know what I can't stand when you're like, damn, it's good, but it's only one season. What am I going to do now? (laughs) 
You know what I mean? When you get, <laughs> you're like, oh, so disappointing. Yeah. Yeah. I actually, I generally tend to have the opposite problem more often. Oh. So I'm, I'm the kind of person, if, if I start a show uh-huh. and watch enough of it, I have this urge to watch the entire thing. Okay. And I find that there are a number Complete of shows a surge. <laughs> that I like that either ended at a good place or just kind of, and then restarted and sort of kept going on forever. That I recently was catching up with Curb Your Enthusiasm, which I love, especially the original run. But it's at a certain point, a lot of these shows, I can't think of any shows that have been really great after nine seasons. And I feel like yeah. in sort of the streaming age yeah. now, I, I feel like given the amount of money that are, people are throwing at these established properties, I find my problem is too it's many shows that I like. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, where they pick up pieces that are like, wow, that was from a long time ago and you're paying that price. Wow. I don't get, there must be some, someone's job is calculating the math on that. Mm-hmm. And like the value of a show that's 20 years old or 13 years or whatever. Anyway, really interesting. Okay, Mark, maybe as a transition, what do you think the future of journalism is? I think it's definitely becoming more relatively, the keyword is relatively more Mm -hmm. stable than it's been over the last, say, 10 to 15 years. I initially first wanted to get into journalism. Initially, through, I originally wanted to be a movie critic, but that's a different story. But the oh. time in which I first became interested in journalism broadly was around like 07, 08, when the bottom was sort of falling out. Yeah, I was there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. My timing ended up being very fortuitous because I, I kind of graduated college right around the time. I think things started to kind of stabilize a little bit, at least within business journalism. I definitely have felt a major improvement since... 08, 09, at least in, in terms of my following it. And it seems like, you know, the industry is starting to kind of figure out the right balance between advertising-based revenue models and subscription-based models. And mm-hmm. I mean, I'm also lucky to be in business journalism, which I think is generally yeah. has an easier time making money than other kinds of journalism because there's, I would imagine, always going to be a number of people who are willing to pay for exclusive or novel information, you know, about what's going on with them and their competition. So Mm-hmm. I think that helps as well, but I also know that there are a lot of people, I think particularly people who work for newspapers, who are excellent reporters for decades, but for whatever reason, their skill sets isn't seen as valuable by a lot of media companies now. So I realize it's not the case for everyone, and I realize a lot of people who are struggling for reasons that are out of their control. But I think broadly, it seems like things are becoming relatively more stable, which you know makes me broadly optimistic for the future. Broadly optimistic. I think that's the way to go. It's never boring. And what a time of how it's evolved. I now doing this for a little while, a couple conversations were, oh, about all the sub stacks, you know, oh, that's changing. And then, oh, you know, all the local media is going away. And like, oh, but then there's so many, the information is a great example of niche subscription-based journalism that is deeply valued, that is growing, that is hiring, all this stuff. It's really something. What a time. What a time, Mark. That's all I could say. Indeed. Wow. Well, Mark, thank you for being on today. We've so enjoyed it. Mark Matusek, thank you so much for being here. Reporter from The Information. Check it out, everybody. Send him some good information that is good sources, not annoying. And check out that subject line example. I'm going to go back and think about that, Mark. That was great. Uh, Well, thanks, Beck, for having me. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Thanks, Mark. See ya. Take care. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of Coffee with the Journalist featuring Mark Matusik from The Information. If you enjoy listening to our show, make sure to subscribe on iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and anywhere else you listen to podcasts. And if you have a moment, please leave us a review to share your thoughts about the show and today's guest. To learn more about the latest tools on OnePitch and to subscribe to our weekly podcast newsletter, head to our website at onepitch.co. We'll see you all next week with a brand new guest and even more insights about the journalists you want to learn more about. Until then, start great stories.